What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the 2023-2024 season finale of Studs and Duds, the most comprehensive NFL player review series on the internet. For those longtime viewers of the channel, I know you've been waiting for this one, so thank you for your patience. How this is going to work here for the finale, I'm going to be making eight of these episodes over the coming weeks, doing them four teams at a time by division as each division is fully eliminated from the playoffs. So we'll be getting through these in due time as the playoffs wrap up here. Um, but before we do get started, as always, I like to let people that may be new to the series know what Studs and Duds is all about. And what you may not know is back in 2016, this channel got its start actually as a Madden channel where I have a custom community roster where I go and edit the player ratings to be what are, in my opinion, more accurate and realistic. And then... You know, I'd come on here and talk about what I was seeing in the games and why I made those changes. And while I no longer make Madden content on this channel, I do still do some rebuilds and stuff over on TFG Plays, my second channel, if you want to check that out. I do still make that roster and this series because it's a great way for me to do my research and stay on top of everybody around the league, but it's also a great way to convey and take a wide lens look at who the rising and falling players around the league are, who's trending up, who's maybe not playing so well for every single player around the NFL. And throughout this video, you're gonna be seeing those Madden ratings going up or down. Um, but I do want you to know that those changes do a pretty good job to reflect how I perceive these players in real life. And the changes certainly stem from me watching the film and doing my own research and analysis. Uh, but without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy. Please do hit that like button as we get into it and let's get started. And we are off with the NFC North starting with the Chicago Bears whose star of the season, which is basically the star of weeks eight and beyond because our last episode left off at week seven, but that doesn't really, you know, run off the tongue as nicely. Uh, but the star of the season, which is basically the highest riser of the team, uh, is Jalen Johnson. <sighs> they got to pay this man, dude. Like, the only cornerback that was really in Sauce Gardner's realm of existence in terms of like yards allowed, preventing receptions, preventing touchdowns, just being a shutdown corner. And pardon my nasally voice, by the way, I'm still trying to get over this cold, but the only one that was even in the same realm of existence, if you do those like scatter charts, was Jalen Johnson, who... I would say the first couple years of his career, he was good, but more streaky, which is normal for a young corner. But in the second half of last season, he really started to flash that he could be a superstar. And then this year, yet again, basically as long as he's been out there, he's been incredible. Now, availability has been a relative question mark for him. And I think that's probably the gap between why the Bears maybe are a little hesitant to pay him a bunch of money because he hasn't really gotten through a year fully healthy. But clearly, when he's out there, he's an ascending superstar, man. And he's going to be a very fascinating player, a fascinating player to follow here this free agency. What he gets paid, who pays him. Uh, does he get franchise tag here in Chicago? Is he okay with that? Because he's out there, I think, was it at the Pro Bowl, getting an interception, doing the show me the money thing. Um, well deserved, whatever he gets paid. He, he's been fantastic. And. Uh, was was one of many pieces that were key parts of of why this uh, this defense really clicked on in the second half of the year. Uh, but let's let's visit this offense before we talk about many of those defensive pieces and a lot of good and a lot of bad with this offense. They were kind of sorting through a lot of the weeds of who's going to be a piece of this offense next year, who's not going to be a piece of this offense next year, and. Of course, that conversation is going to start with Justin Fields, who I am going to give a plus one. I, I think he finished the second half of this year playing his best football. That's that's pretty well documented um, and deserves a plus one for it. You know, I think he was seeing his first read a little bit better, a little bit more accurate, I think, in the second half of the year than he's been here in Chicago, not really putting the ball in harm's way. Um, just, you know, 
playing quarterback at a at a relatively good level. Um, not a great level, not a even particularly consistent level, I, I would say. And I do think, you know, this this conversation has been beat into the dirt at this point. Uh, I do think they will move on from Justin Fields. I think they will fetch a second round pick for him, whether that's from Atlanta or Pittsburgh or New England or whoever. But because he is playing well, the Bears are able to get good draft return for him. And I'm excited to see his story continue as well. It just hasn't really worked out here in Chicago. And if the Bears didn't get the number one pick from Carolina and there wasn't, you know, one of the best quarterback prospects in the last 10 years, you know, sitting there available for them with the number one pick, you're probably talking about, you know, him building momentum into next year with this Bears team. But I, I just don't think that's the way it's gonna gonna end up playing out here in Chicago. But uh he himself is is playing well. So Field's gonna go up one. But then we get to Darnell Mooney, who has had a rough couple of years here in Chicago after a very promising start to his career. You know, he's a guy that's definitely looking forward to a fresh start somewhere else. And can you not see Darnell Mooney going to like Kansas City or Buffalo as a wide receiver too and getting right back to being a guy that a couple years ago I would have compared to Brandon Cooks really was trending in that direction. Like I could totally see it. Um, But unfortunately, you know, he himself has not been as good this year, especially a lot of drops. I think he was only two for 11 on contested catch looks this year where he's been much better than that in years past. Um, but also just, you know, yards per route run, just not being a part of the offense. Um, it just it just has not worked out here. He's he's going to come down one as he heads towards free agency. But I, I do like Darnell Mooney's game and think he can um, get this back in the right direction in a, in a change of scenery. But then Cole Komet has had a, a monstrous season in terms of volume, 70 three receptions on the year, 719 yards, you know, very much just being that kind of possession tight end, but he's been tough after the catch, which has been an asset for the Bears in the dump down game, Uh, but also just one drop on 88 targets. So you talk about a possession tight end, uh, a guy that can just be reliable underneath. That's been Cole Komet. He's not the most explosive player. He's not the best run blocker, um, but you know, they gave him a pretty big contract that a lot of people laughed about. And I, I would say he's played up to that contract. He's had his best year. The Bears were banking on him, kind of, you know, projecting him forward basically to this when they paid him what they did. And uh, good on the Bears and good on Cole Komet for, for you know, making it worth the Bears' while. Uh, on the other hand, Robert Tunyon really didn't make it work here in Chicago. Can't remember if that was a one-year deal or a two-year deal, but either way, I mean, what a non-existent season for Robert Tunyon. Just no explosiveness, not much of a blocker. Seems to be yet another one of these guys, Alan Lazard, Geronimo Allison. There's a long list of them throughout the list, uh, the, throughout the range of Aaron Rodgers' career where soon as that guy goes to a different quarterback, there's just not much of a chemistry there. Um, but uh, yeah, Tunyon's going to come down. L- let's talk about this offensive line. It's it's a little all over the place, honestly. And, um, you know, what the good thing for the Bears is they do seem to me to have some cornerstone pieces. And some Bears fans don't think that way about Braxton Jones. And I'm not going to sit here and say he's like an elite left tackle or that you'd be like insane to look for an upgrade because I think Braxton Jones is probably, oh, I don't know, off the top of my head, like the 24th best left tackle in the NFL. So it's not to say he couldn't do better or that he doesn't have room to grow, um, but he really has been solid. I, you know, he's had two two big games you look at that were pretty bad. The Cleveland game, Miles Garrett, and uh, the final game of the year against uh, the Packers where the the combination of Preston Smith and uh, Lucas Van Ness kind of got the best of him. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, he was really solid all year long. He's an underrated run blocker. He's an underrated athlete. They like to uh, run a lot of sweeps and stuff and get him on the move, and he's really good at finding that second-level defender and putting him on his ass. So, I mean, Braxton Jones is a really good player, and you know, maybe if you upgraded at left tackle at some point, kick him in a guard or kick Darnell in a guard. I I don't know, but um, he, to me, is a a one-of-five starter easily. 
And then Darnell Wright at right tackle, the, the rookie rookie right tackle, uh, top 10 pick here. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say he was incredible, but he definitely, um, you know, played up to his draft pedigree and, and not a lot of first round tackles are able to do that right away. I mean, look at Evan Neal, even Andrew Thomas is in his first year. Wasn't great, but Darnell Wright was, um, I, I would say an average right tackle right out the gate. And, a. Honestly, a better run blocker than I expected. And maybe I overthought this um, just based on watching his film. But he just he seemed to fall off a lot of blocks in the run game at Tennessee where he would lunge and kind of miss with his hands and not stick on blockers. And then obviously he's, he's such a freaky mover at his size that... Uh, he had some crazy impact blocks, but I was worried about his consistency as a run blocker coming out of Tennessee. And, and Darnell Wright and the Bears cleaned that right up because I did not notice him like slipping off blocks as much in the run game. So that was definitely improved. And I do think he is their right tackle of the future. And then Tevin Jenkins, who has slid from tackle inside to guard, again, with the exception of that Packers game where the offensive line just really left the season on a sour note for the Bears. But really, with the exception of that game, Tevin Jenkins was playing at pretty much a Pro Bowl caliber level. Like, I remember when I did my live Pro Bowl voting video, Bears fans were really upset that I didn't put Tevin Jenkins in there as my Pro Bowl vote. And I was responding to some of those comments where I was like, you know, he's playing at that level, but he had missed a few too many games for me to want to vote him for the Pro Bowl. But that's really, you know, both pass protection and run blocking. He's been a menace. Uh, so hopefully he can stay healthy and you've got three out of five there for your offensive line. Um, but as we talk about some of the negative notes for this offensive line, they 100% need a center and they have an expensive right guard here in Nate Davis who did not play very well. And Davis was a guy that was always kind of a liability in pass protection in Tennessee until his contract year was a slight red flag. Um, and unfortunately, that red flag flared up for the Bears. He really was not reliable um, getting in front of pass rushers all season long. And you'd think they're probably stuck with him again just based on what they're paying him. Now, if you can get a better center next to him, uh, that could help, but I do want to drop Nate Davis as I'm dropping the center here, Lucas Patrick, who has now had the second year in a row, a row of just being a turnstile for the Bears. It's like this was some sort of a sleeper cell spy from Green Bay situation where Patrick was like an adequate center slash guard for the Packers in the same system that Luke Getze's running here. And then he came to Chicago and was just, again, a turnstile. So he's going to come down. I don't expect him to be back. Maybe Green Bay will pick him back up, and he'll be a really good backup again for them. <laughs> Can you not picture it? Um, but, yeah, th those two pieces right there, center and and right guard, are going to be the question marks heading into next year. And, again, I think I think you just got to hope Nate Davis can, can get better because uh, he was better in Tennessee the year before. But, yeah. Um, and then a couple of the backups that had to play because they had some injuries here. Uh, Larry Borum had to play at left tackle when Braxton Jones got hurt. And uh, Borum ha has started a lot of games for the Bears, but he had a lot more bad starts this time around. And they weren't against like world beating offensive lines either. Uh, uh, defensive lines, rather. I mean, he gave up eight pressures to Washington. Granted, that was that was going against at the time. I think Chase Young, but still, I mean, Chase Young is not a world beater. I, I can't really stress how many pressures eight pressures is. That's that's obscene. Also, had a really tough outing against the Chargers, and yeah, I, I think he's a good backup. Um, but at this point, the hope that Larry Borum could turn into more than that is is dead. And I think, you know, just seeing some of the weaknesses this year, we're going to we're going to bring him down a little bit more towards that backup high end backup tackle uh, grade level. Then on the interior offensive line as well, Cody Whitehair. I mean, he's he's almost 32 years old. 
is very much been just living off of years and years and years and years and years ago when he was like a really quality starter for the Bears. He's just been kind of steadily declining, and this was the worst of his years. They tried him at center. It was a disaster. Like, they would have put him back in over Lucas Patrick um, at some point if if he was any good there, and he wasn't. He wasn't good at guard when Tevin Jenkins went down. So, you know, Whitehair is, I would imagine, probably done finally in Chicago here. I don't know what his contract situation is, but... You would think they could save some money by getting out of that. But let's flip over to the defensive side of the ball where it's all good. I mean, I, I said we're we're in this episode, we're looking at weeks eight and beyond, and that's basically the point where the Bears' defense turned a corner. I think that's right around the point they traded for Montez Sweat, which is a good starting point for us here. Now, I, I think Montez Sweat has mostly been the player that he's been which is a really good kind of low-end one, high-end two pass rusher. In fact, his total pressure numbers are nearly identical to what they were last year. 64 pressures this year, 62 pressures last year. The difference was this year he doubled his sack total and for the first time was able to finish and get up to double-digit sacks credited with 16 this year. Um, so just want to give him a little bit of love, a little bit of respect for that. And um, just the consistency for him is, has now been back-to-back years of, of really high-end edge play. And what a stat for him. He led two NFL teams in sacks this year. Now, I think that's more of an indictment on the other pass rushers on the Bears and the Commanders, uh, but still a ton of fun. And um, what, a, what a trade that was. I'm going to give myself a little bit of a pat on the back for for praising the Bears and saying how much of a no-brainer this trade was when the consensus opinion was this was an overpay. And I'm going to give myself a pat on my other back um, for Yannick Ngakwe here, who on the flip side, when the Bears signed Yannick Ngakwe, I was like, all right, he doesn't move the needle. Bears fans were pissed. And He's been a complete liability for the Bears. He's been horrible. Like, you got to think at this point, he's just checked out. A pressure percentage under 10% this year was either injured or benched at the end of the year. I I don't know, Bears fans. Probably injured because he wasn't playing at all. But he saw his snap counts reducing from 30, 40, 50 snaps a game down to, you know, 20, 25 snaps a game. And then at that week 14 mark, he just stopped playing. So I'm sure he got hurt and I missed it. But this is how bad it is. If you sort by pass rushers that played uh, at least 50% of their team snaps, which is 58 players, PFF pass rush win rate. Yannick Ngakwe is dead last out of 58 in pass rush win rate. He's not just dead last, though, because 57th is Jihad Ward, who had 9.6%, which is almost double of Yannick Ngakwe's 5.1%, which, in my opinion, makes Yannick Ngakwe the worst pass rusher in the NFL this year. Um, Maybe not literally, but in terms of hurting his team's ability to get after the quarterback? Yes, because nobody was playing the snaps he was getting while losing close to as many snaps as as Ngakwe was. I mean, talk about living off of name value. And and the the writing was on the wall the year before for the Colts, which is why I was very and not anti that signing, but I was like don't get your hopes up for Yannick Ngakwe. Uh, he's going to be 29 years old, and he's going to have to enter, like, vet minimum type of contract and, like, get some sort of uh, uh, progress going here because this is not a player you can roster right now. Oh, and by the way, that's just pass rushing. Like, Yannick has been as bad against the run this year as he's ever been, which has already been bad. So he's just been completely horrible. I, honestly, I'm looking at that 74 rating, and I'm like, that's probably too high, but he's still two years removed from a pretty good year. He's only 29. Maybe he can turn it around, but um, yeah, tough. Then we look inside 
uh, on the D-line. And both these rookies, I think in the second half of the year, it wasn't anything astronomical, but we're pretty good. Uh, Javon Dexter ended up the year with like 30 pressures, four sacks, started to increase his workload as the year went on. And the nice thing about Dexter is I think they've really worked with him to get off the ball a little bit quicker. He still is, um, I mean, it, this was all about my draft analysis. Like, and I wasn't the only one that said this. He was the most uniquely slow off the ball defensive tackle you'll ever see. And, and Bears fans are familiar with that narrative because it was just, you watched the tape and you noticed it. He would, the ball would get snapped and he would just stand straight up. Um, I still think his pad level needs to stay lower and, and he needs to get more consistent with it. But you did see him with more of an arched back out, off the snap and, and getting into the backfield and penetrating a little bit more. Um, and that's when you can start to see just his raw strength and quickness and athletic ability, uh, you know, start to produce. I, I, I don't think we saw a ton of like dominant pass rush wins from him. It was a lot of looping and twists and uh, effort wins from him, which those count, right? But that's going to be the next step for him is can you line him up one on one and turn him into a game wrecker? Because I really think that's the type of potential he has. And I think you you saw everything you could have asked for from him in year one. He was always going to be a project. And, uh, you know, ch he checked all the boxes he needed to in year one, and, and year two should be exciting for him. Uh, so he's going to get a plus two. And then Zach Pickens, I, I couldn't believe when I was talking about Zach Pickens and in, in my, like, draft grades, and they had already announced, like, Zach Pickens is going to be the nose tackle. I'm like... What, what were you guys watching from Zach Pickens? Like, he had a horrible anchor. He's undersized. He's not a run defender, really. He's more of a penetrating pass rusher type. And they did. They, they put him out there and tried to play him at nose tackle for the first, like, eight weeks of the year. And he was horrible. He was truly horrible. Like, as bad as you could have imagined. And then they were like, all right, like, week eight? That's enough of that. Zach, you're, you're a three-tech. Just go be a penetrator, get upfield, and wow, shocker, he wasn't completely miserable at it. Uh, still a long way to go, uh, but, you know, he, he was much better. Uh, ended up getting a couple pass rush wins scattered throughout the season, and um, yeah, just a nice little plus one for Zach Pickens, but stop playing him at nose tackle Chicago, and I think they learned that lesson. Then you get to the linebackers. Uh, Zach, uh, Jack Sanborn continues to just play that perfect role as a third linebacker here. Uh, just comes in early downs, finds the ball, super consistent. Uh, do we know if he can be more than that? I mean, maybe T this is how TJ Edwards started his career, uh, was kind of as that third linebacker uh, rotating in, doing some early down work. And there's a ton of similarities between Sanborn and TJ Edwards here. Uh, who is a full three-down starter. And, and man, TJ Edwards, the dude was, I, I think, either tied for second or third in the NFL in defensive stops. He continues to be surprisingly present in pass defense. Like, he's, he's still not a great athlete. He's not someone you want, like, manning up guys. But he has some of the most active zone eyes of any linebacker in the league. He's easily one of the, I, I don't know, I'll just play it safe and say five highest IQ linebackers in the league in terms of just understanding what the offense is trying to do to him. He's clearly better than Tremaine Edmonds next to him. And I mean, Edmonds was like fine, but TJ Edwards must just be laughing because uh, Edmonds got paid like twice what TJ Edwards got and Edwards is maybe twice the linebacker. <laughs> Uh, or at least does a lot more stuff a lot better. Um, but yeah, it, he's awesome, man. Have really enjoyed his his rise in the NFL as an undrafted linebacker. Um, but then into the secondary, this, is, this was really something you looked at coming into the year as an area of excitement for the Bears. It was an unproven group with Jalen Johnson and Tyreek Stevenson and Kyler Gordon. And obviously, we already talked about Jalen Johnson, but it hasn't just been him in this secondary. Uh, Second-round rookie Tyreek Stevenson, who was a huge my guy in this draft. I thought he was one of the bigger steals in the draft. Anytime you can get a guy that, you know, I was comfortable with him in the first round, they get him in the second. And 
man, he had his he had his ups and downs to start the year. He's an aggressive guy. He's a physical guy. Uh, he can find himself in in compromising situations because of that. But um, less and less as the year went on was he getting beat and more and more was he making plays on the ball intercepting balls winning over bears fans he's he's sick man 13 pass breakups four picks in his rookie year and just finished incredibly strong man uh this is like god just get jalen johnson back chicago because with him as your one stevenson as a playmaking two and then kyler gordon really settling in in the slot being super steady coverage wise a little week to week as a run defender i would say with kyler gordon i still think consistency wise um he can get even better in terms of getting to the ball uh tackling consistency and all that but still a very good year for him i mean these guys really can grow together here in in year two of the system as a trio and Man, the, the sky's the limit for these guys. It really is. Uh, and then they have a, a really fun fourth corner as well. Terrell Smith, who was a fifth-round pick out of Minnesota. A ton of athletic ability and size. And it's not to say he doesn't have upside to become a starter in, in the league. But for now, like, what a fun chess piece to have as your fourth. Like, a guy that can match up on tight ends. Uh, if you have an injury one week. Uh, he can play in the slot. He can play outside against anybody. Like, man, what a... F- Again, I know I'm just saying this and raving about this, but what a fun secondary. I would just be devastated if the Bears didn't find a way to get Jalen Johnson back. But I, I think they will. Um, and this group could be could be a really special unit next year. And then that's not even mentioning Jaquan Brisker, who, man, I mean, that's another second-round pick with a really solid ability on the back end and and... He, he as well became much more consistent in unison with all of this stuff working together into the second half of, of, of this Matt Eberflus's defense, of him as a player. You know, he was their first big defensive draft pick, right, was, was Jaquan Brisker. It was either him or Kyla Gordon. I can't remember who came off the board first, but this was the vision for Eberflus, was this young cornerback group coming together, and uh, it really did, and, and safety group. I believe they call that a secondary, <laughs> but yeah, Brisker was uh, ha- had the best run of coverage consistency these last few weeks. May- maybe not like a million plays on the ball or anything, but not credited with a lot of yards allowed. Had a pretty monstrous day as well in that second game against Detroit, where he did have a couple pass breakups. Had another really nice pass breakup against Arizona. So um, you you did see the you did start to see the the ball production. Uh, a little bit more here in the second half of the year. Only had two pass breakups in his rookie season and two in the first half of this season. Um, But again, three pass breakups there in the second half of the year. So love to see it. Bears fans should be very excited uh, about this defense and, and about this team in general. Okay, Detroit Lions time. Lions fans, I hope you guys have gotten over the devastating loss because we've got a lot to celebrate here for this team season and I'm looking at this spread of incredible performances this season and candidates for star of the season and I just I can't isolate any one of these guys I mean shout out Jared Goff Jameer Gibbs Amon Ra St. Brown Penny Sewell Frank Ragnow Aiden Hutchinson you tell me who is the star of the season. This whole group came together unlike any team this year. And I just, I can't pick one star of the season for this team unless you want to just use this as, as an opportunity to say Ben Johnson for being a star, for telling the commanders to F off. I'm staying in Detroit. Uh, Cause I mean, to do that back to back years, uh, how great is that for the lions? But uh, let's talk about these players, man. Um, I'm just, I was so wrong about this Lions team. These guys have emerged, like a lot of these guys have just emerged as superstars, dude. And, and that, that stops like maybe just short of Jared Goff, who I think clearly is, is at the, he's the best version of himself right now within this offense in Detroit, including playoffs. The dude threw for 5,400 yards, 34 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. This was the first time also since 2019 
that he had more big time throws than turnover worthy plays per PFF. But you're really seeing like there is value in a guy playing now like 10,000 snaps in his career. He's at a little short of that 8,400 8, snaps. But the more you play, the quicker the game moves, no matter who you are. And Jared Goff has worked at this thing. And he just has all the answers to the test. He's becoming more and more of that. Like, I, I don't want to say Tom Brady, because obviously he's not at Tom Brady's level in terms of like navigating pressure and all that. But when you want to talk about like just knowing his offense, knowing where the ball needs to go, getting his time to throw down to a career low of 2.58 seconds, although that's not true. That shitty rookie year he was at 2.47 because he had to get the ball out immediately or he was going to die um, but other than that this is a career low in time to throw his pressure to sack percentage is is lower than it's been in most of his recent seasons and then you see career high in completion percentage highest he's been in yards per attempt since his second season in los angeles to me it's that decision making though and the consistency with it it felt like for years arguably even like the first year when he got to Detroit as well it felt like for years Jared Goff any given week was a disaster waiting to happen and that just doesn't feel like that's Jared Goff anymore he had a slight like minor hiccup in the middle of the season there like week 11 or so where it felt like, ooh, maybe is that guy creeping back up? But he cleaned it straight back up and got right back on track to the guy he had been going back to last season. So where I'm going with this is, is Jared Goff, to me, I really think he's a tier two quarterback. Like, at the end of the tier, sure. And what I mean by a tier two quarterback is, I, I think Jared Goff is, is not a, he's not a tier one guy. He's not a guy you win because of. But he's not a tier three guy anymore in that he's a guy that you win with. There's a middle ground there, though, right? It's like kind of like what Matthew Stafford was for all those years, where he is a quarterback that helps you win. And that very much has felt like Jared Goff this year. And he's definitely entering the top three to five quarterbacks in the league in terms of just being that surgeon from the pocket. So um, just love what I've seen from Jared Goff. Any thoughts of like moving on from Jared Goff like I would have had last year talking about maybe moving up for like an Anthony Richardson? I, I'm not having those thoughts right now with Jared Goff at all. Um, then let's talk about these running backs. You know, David Montgomery, I, I feel like he was always this guy. He's just getting run blocking now, but he is going to go up for having a career year. Just a plus one here, but just so reliable. Uh, was a big part of finishing out that game uh, against the Bucks as well down the stretch there. And then Jameer Gibbs, this is the, the pick of their draft that I was so critical of that I was wrong about the criticism. Like, I didn't see the vision for how Jameer Gibbs was going to be this big of an impact on the offense. Now, I will say, before we just glaze him up, he still has some stuff to clean up. If he wants to truly be like a Christian McCaffrey or Jamal Charles or even like a Aaron Jones consistent level impact type of guy, like the fumbles obviously showed up um, late in the year in, in the final game of the year was like a big reason they blew that game uh, on that same play as well. Like <clears throat> the football awareness, he ran the wrong direction and got the play all sloppy to begin with. There's just some plays where he's not hitting the right holes, not to mention a bunch of drops in the receiving game. So like he's he still has some aspects of the position that he he's actually really needs to learn. But the explosiveness and and really where I I didn't see him being so dynamic was the ability to run through contact. His contact balance is really impressive for a guy that's 200 pounds who is, I, I would say, the most explosive running back in the NFL in terms of speed, foot speed, um, change of direction, acceleration. It's it's insane. He's a blur out there. Um, but the fact that when guys are getting their hands on him, he's slipping tackles and running through arm tackles, that's how he can create these 40, 50-yard touchdowns. So I didn't see the vision with that. I thought 12 was an overpay. And I think you're taking this level of a playmaker at the 12th pick in the draft, not to mention they got Sam Laporta out of this too. Like they killed that move right there for sure. So 
like I said, Jameer Gibbs is a is a star of the season candidate. Just you know, clean up clean up some of those fumbles, some of the vision stuff, and we'll be talking about him as uh, really one of the the top five backs in the league. I think not before long. Um, and then Amon Ross St. Brown, I'm I'm again another player. I'm so blown away. He's just shattered whatever concept of a ceiling I thought he might have had as this slot wide receiver. Now he's still primarily a slot wide receiver, but even then, like this year he's shown more ability to like release off of press at the line of scrimmage and win a little bit more on the outside not a ton um but at least a little bit of that but beyond that it's just like the the absolute astronomical dominance that he has in that slot over the middle of the field i really just didn't know that that efficiency was possible from that position for a guy that doesn't have like blazing speed, right? But his consistency, his physicality, his technique in his routes to set up these two-way goes and just still keep these guys in a bind. And then this magical instinctive ability that he has, even if the catch is like, I mean, I mean, it could be 20 yards short of the line to gain. It could be two yards short of the line to gain. His consistency to somehow find a way to get that ball past the third down marker, it, it's it's crazy, man. How can you not love Amon Ross St. Brown, who has just defied the concept of what his upside should be without a lack of speed and, and really size? I mean, he's not the biggest guy. He's strong. He puts his time in in the weight room, obviously. But, um, yeah, he, he's just insane, man. He's one of the best receivers in the NFL. And I think because he's like I said, so astronomically better as a slot wide receiver than like any other guy in the league. It doesn't matter that he can't step outside and fly by a corner and win that way. Right. And it also, we really need to stop comparing guys to Amon Ross St. Brown, because I think we're just going to end up disappointed. Um, there really is only one Amon Ross St. Brown um, now, unfortunately, we are going to lower Josh Reynolds, who we had been hyping up a little bit in the last episode. He started his season really hot. He actually had started to cool off um, mid-season there, and then he had uh, just that catastrophic game against the Niners. I mean, we're all piling on Dan Campbell for going for it. Well, it's like if Josh Reynolds can catch, we're not talking about those go-for uh, or kick decisions. So, I mean, Reynolds, I ideally, I think we all – New over time as a wide receiver four stepped up in some moments this year, but uh, we are going to drop him one here. Uh, Jameson Williams on the on the positive end really bounced back from a rough, you know, first two months of his season. He had the suspension and then he came off the suspension and was really not getting a lot of playing time. Was dropping the ball. Was starting to look more and more like a bust. Uh, but really just, you know, kept his head down. It's a testament to him. It's a testament to this coaching staff and the culture they've built here. Kept his head down, and, and it still hasn't been pretty all the way along the way. He still had some drops, and it hasn't been, like, this seamless implementation for him as the deep threat in this offense. Um, it's been a little more hit or miss, but the the signs have been there. And then to see the the explosiveness on that run, uh, on that opening drive against the Niners, was was wild. So... Uh, they're hoping year three maybe can really build some momentum and uh, maybe phase out Josh Reynolds and phase in Jamison Williams a little bit there. Um, but, I mean, Sam Laporta, I don't even know if I mentioned his name as a star of the season candidate earlier, but sure, throw his name in the ring. Uh, I, I liked Sam Laporta. I certainly didn't love Sam Laporta. Like, uh, the Lions had this vision, and he's immediately stepped in as, let's just play it safe and say a top, Seven tight end in the NFL, probably tight uh, top six ahead of like you're probably not counting Darren Waller up there at this point. So I think top six, unless I'm forgetting someone. It, wow, dude, like the full package of a tight end route running dominant hands, contested catch ability, run after catch, phenomenal uh, speed and ability to be a mismatch problem. The blocking for him to handle all this from the get go. <sighs> I just I've run out of words to describe how impressed I am 
um, by everything involved in Detroit here. So he's an emerging superstar. Taylor Decker had a career year at left tackle as a run blocker. He, you know, you go back like five years, he was probably more known as kind of like a pass protecting specialist. Uh, but within this culture, within this scheme, he has um, really taken a tick up in his dominance at the line of scrimmage. He's not like, you know, maybe not dominance is, is the right word, but um, just effectiveness as a run blocker has been very solid, still a great pass protector. Um, but it does kind of pale in comparison to Pene Sewell. Uh, it's not a disrespect to Taylor Decker. That's that's praising up Pene Sewell. And, and if I'm honest, if I had to pick a star of the season, it might be Pene Sewell because he really has emerged as it's always tough because Trent Williams exists, but I think Penny Sewell is playing at that level right now. Like I think Sewell is, is at worst the second best tackle in the NFL here in year three. And I mean, you, you saw it on his tape at Oregon where he's just this rare specimen in, in the run game. And you know he's he's got I would I would say good athletic ability, but this incredible strength and the instincts and the the desire to be a great run blocker, and it's all just fused perfectly here in Detroit. His ninety five point one PFF run blocking grade, I believe, is the second best ever recorded behind what Trent Williams did two years ago in twenty twenty one with a ninety seven point seven. And it's, it's not like he's some slouch in pass protection either. Like, he's still in development. He's in year three. Um, but, like, he's he's a very, very good one. He's one of the better pass protecting right tackles in the league. So he he's absurd, man. And then Frank Ragnow, I mean, just one of the big storylines of the playoffs was how he was fighting through that injury, still making, like, high-level block, Like, not just fighting through injury, but still making high-level blocks when you're that injured um he i mean he has been one of the best run blocking centers in the league since the day he entered it but i think he has solidified himself there this year um dealt with a lot of like rotating pieces at guard around him too and that that makes things complicated from a pass protection standpoint because you have to really know those double teams and who you're working with how you're passing off stunts and i don't think it's a coincidence that some of his worst pass protecting games came against some of the more stunt heavy fronts teams like Baltimore and Dallas Tampa Bay he was mostly solid as a pass protector not not perfect but um yeah Frank Frank's insane and like the running backs deserve praise here of course but I feel like we don't talk enough about how they have the best tackle center combination in the league even more than philadelphia i would say at this point and that's saying a lot um so yeah obviously the offense insane and then defensively it's not quite as many guys to rave about they that's where you're going to look at them especially in that secondary and say all right they they still got some work to do if they want to get back and improve and go to the super bowl next year um but some of these guys up front did step up ali mcneil has just steadily improved throughout his time uh, just shedding some of that weight, becoming that athletic guy up front, that true three-down player. Missed some time due to injury this year, and they really missed him when he was out, but came back strong, finished strong in the playoffs. And uh, yeah, Ali McNeil is just, I think, still still trending upwards. Uh, and then his draft mate, Levi Onwuzarike, nothing to really rave about here. The, the, he's been injured basically since the day they drafted him. Just hasn't been able to really be an impact for this team at all and and he started to get on the field uh maybe you know 10 snaps a game towards the last couple months of the year and you know had it was a nice rotational two-way player for for what it was if he can stay healthy maybe he can be a bigger part of that rotation next year and then Aiden Hutchinson talk about another star of the year candidate uh geez dude like when I compared him to Max Crosby coming out a I didn't see Max Crosby becoming a tier one edge rusher and then i didn't see aiden hutchinson being that so quickly um i mean this individual season his production was stride for stride with all the best pass rushers in the league if you include his playoff games aiden hutchinson had 121 pressures like i think we went the last three seasons without a player 
over 100 pressures, including Aaron Donald. So that's just stupid territory. Now, there were other players this year that had over 100 pressures because there were some really bad offensive lines this year. But still, that's a huge testament to the level Aiden Hutchinson has reached so quickly. And if he repeats this type of season again next year, we are talking about someone that is in that, you know, tier one where I think Max Crosby entered this year, but up there with like Garrett and Watt and and Bosa and all those like, you know, tier one guys. And that's, I suppose, higher than I really thought of Aiden Hutchinson. I knew I knew it could be a one, but I didn't know he was going to be like a freaking Hall of Fame caliber pass rusher, which is really what we're talking about there. Very curious to see if, if he'll repeat those numbers. Uh, but he's already in the conversation for, uh, you know, it's kind of like a debate for who's the sixth best pass rusher in the league because you got Parson in no particular order, Parsons, Bosa, uh, Garrett, Watt, and Crosby. You know, you got now it's like Josh Allen, Aiden Hutchinson, Gary, maybe. Hutchinson's like right in the debate already for that sixth spot heading into next year, which is crazy. Then you get to the second level. Not a, not a ton of movement for the linebackers. I thought that group played solid. Uh, they, they rotated that group a ton. And I think they mostly played up to the ratings I have on those guys. I'm going to give uh, Derek Barnes a plus one. Gets that interception to seal the Bucks game. I think it's a huge testament to him that he worked himself into being actually the second highest snap getter amidst all these linebackers with first round pick Jack Campbell, Malcolm Rodriguez, Obviously, Alex Anzalone had a very solid year. Um, even Jalen Reeves may have been like rotated in and out a little bit, but Burns pretty much could have easily been the first man out of that rotation because of his draft pedigree, but really earned this with, with his tenacity to get to the football as a run defender and then starting to see some of that coverage ability kick up now. I mean, he's still new to the linebacker position. He was mostly an edge at Purdue, but he, he is the best athlete in that room. Uh, at least relative to their size. And he's really holding on to a role here. Wouldn't expect that to really change heading into a contract year next year either. Um, but let's talk about the secondary. So some good, some bad. You know, the, the outside corner situation is such a clear and obvious number one need for Detroit. Cameron Sutton, that signing just hasn't really worked out for them. Really what was, was pretty bad this year, especially down the stretch. You know, we played a lot of slot in Pittsburgh. They would play him outside out of necessity. And I also just, I mean, they got into doing a lot of, like, you know, blitzing and press man and stuff. And that's just not Cam Sutton's game. Like, Sutton is one of the smartest zone corners I've watched in a while. But, um, I mean, he's just not a, he's not a press man corner. So he did get exposed, but the plays weren't there. He's got to come down. And then Jerry Jacobs had to play because... I mean, unfortunately, uh, Emmanuel Mosley just wasn't really available for them this year. So they had to play Jerry Jacobs, who's, you know, had a good start to the year. We actually had raised him in the last episode, uh, but teams really started to pick on him. You can just tell why he went undrafted. Like, he's just not someone that can hang man to man. So that's something they're really going to want to focus on is increasing their ability to play press man. And um, I obviously have done a lot of apologizing about my takes on the Lions draft, but I will say one of my criticisms was taking Jack Campbell over, say, a Joey Porter or Deontay Banks, who were available with that pick, and I think you would easily flip that right now with how those players looked in their rookie years, but um, still a great draft overall, in part because they got this dude right here, Brian Branch, in the second round. Um, I mean, seriously, you, you could argue Brian Branch is already the best slot corner in the NFL. And I've had Lions fans yell at me for saying he's a slot corner. I'm like, dude, he, he played three snaps as a safety in the last three months of the season. Every other snap was as a slot corner. The dude's a slot corner. He was a slot corner at Alabama. He's a slot corner in Detroit. They did early in the year. They did play him in some more like strong safety rotational stuff. But I mean, this is where he's most comfortable. He's sticky man to man. He's an asset as a run defender in that space. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I don't see why they would change this. They have other safeties they like. And I think it's probably best that people just accept that Brian Branch is going to be a technically a cornerback in the NFL. He's never going to really play outside, but that's fine. 
he does this position as well as anybody. And to get that in the middle of the second round, you're going to do that every single day of the damn week. Um, so they stole a lot of value there in Brian Branch. And uh, I can't really speak enough about, I mean, a guy to step in and be the best at his position out the gate. What, what else you want me to say, right? Like, that's crazy. Um, and then safety of Fetu Melifanu, he's a guy that was a corner and is now safety. And he's very much playing that kind of PJ Williams role in this. It's still a Saints inspired scheme. It's it's definitely deviated from what Aaron Glenn would have been kind of underneath in New Orleans. Um, but in terms of that sixth defensive back, uh, just coming in and being a matchup corner or a, you know a, a, a buzz zone defender or someone that can cause some confusion and rotate or what he really started doing late in the year and being like an elite blitzer, uh, just a absolute chess piece. This is the perfect role for Melifanu because I really thought his cornerback tape was overrated, but you loved the tools, you loved the physicality and some of the playmaking ability, and this is the perfect freaking role for him. So they have found something in this, like the middle of, like the spine of the secondary with Branch and Melifanu and these safeties are all very solid. It's just they've got to find some outside cornerbacks. And it looks like that's a pretty good draft to find those guys. So um, we'll see. We'll see who they end up with. But uh, yeah, man, what a what a freaking fun year for for Detroit. And despite all the back and forth I've had with Lions fans, I, I, had, a, I had a blast watching this team uh, storm through the playoffs, prove me wrong. And and at least in my mind, I'm back on board. I never really was off board. I just had you know was too low on them coming into the year. But you see a team. A team, like emphasis, all caps, T-E-A-M, everybody coming together, the GM, the coach, the culture, the players. It's This is why I do my job, right? Like the teams that do this like Detroit and prove people wrong and have foresight and, and develop players like this, you got to celebrate when a team can can figure this out. It's, it's really fun. Next up, we have the Green Bay Packers who have kind of created this atomic bomb that just might be the most movement we've ever seen in this series. A lot of factors going into that. Normally, this isn't a look at, you know, almost a full season of football, basically weeks eight, and in the Packers case, through two extra playoff games. On top of that, this was the youngest team in the NFL and a team that basically as of our last episode, which was week seven this team has completely pulled a u-turn on their season so there's a lot of different things to talk about with this team from the last time we were out with them in this series so buckle up um starting with the star of the season uh you know who it is it's jordan love who went from again where this season uh, series ended up he was getting lowered by two in the ratings was just coming off of that Denver loss, the Raiders game where he throws the game losing interception, the Lions game where he looked a little flustered. Um, he was just coming off of that. And then from weeks nine on, Jordan Love was, I mean, I'll leave it at arguably the best quarterback in the NFL, but stats, grading profile, uh, eye test watching the film, I mean, seriously, I'll just leave it at that. Arguably the best quarterback in the NFL for the second half of the season, enough to go on a playoff run for a team that season looked like it was just in the in the can to go to Dallas and have an elite quarterback performance as he did. And yes, his season didn't end the way that you would have dreamed throwing that interception across his body. The guy gets so many Brett Favre comparisons being a Packers quarterback. You didn't really want it to be compared to that play. Uh, but obviously you hope the young quarterback in his first year as a starter can learn from that mistake and not do that because that was not the type of mistake he was making for three months of football, right? It just uh, was was a horrible decision in a, in a bad moment. But I mean... Man, the Packers have done it again. They found a quarterback that doesn't just have the physical tools. He's been, like, dissecting defenses. You look at how he was able to handle 
uh, multiple types of defenses that throw a lot of stuff at you on this run. The Kansas City Chiefs defense with Steve Spagnolo, um, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense that mixes and matches their punches as good as anyone um, facing and, and getting better against Brian Flores' defense in Minnesota that was confusing teams all year. And then, of course, capped off by going into Dallas, one of the best defenses in the league, certainly one of the best pass defenses in the league, and doing what he did there. I mean, those are those are teams that are going to throw blitzes at you, mix up looks, and try to confuse a young quarterback. And just in terms of processing things pre-snap, making checks, being a signal caller, that's where you can really see those four years of experience sitting and learning the offense, learning the terminology and the checks. Um, you can see where that showed up. And then you get the pocket presence from Jordan Love that is just so impressive, um, which to me is what was why I was always so much higher on Jordan Love, was there's only so many quarterbacks that can just naturally feel that rush, navigate to that empty space in the pocket or outside of the pocket, and buy time to extend plays when it's needed. There's just so much to like here, and as long as he continues this trajectory and doesn't let that mistake against San Francisco get to his head, it doesn't just seem like Green Bay found a franchise quarterback. It seems like they may have found a, a potential superstar quarterback, and next year is going to be a lot of hype heading into the into the season because it's not just him. You look at this offense going up. This was the youngest offense in the National Football League by... I believe a year and a half gap between the next team up. They went with a total youth approach that showed early in the season, but it paid dividends in the second half of the year where they were one of the, I don't know, eight to 10 best offenses in the league, if not better. And all of these young weapons really stepped up. Now, of course, they want Christian Watson to figure out those hamstring issues, but even he started to play better in the second half of the season. We had just started to call him out in the last episode of Studs and Duds, so that's pro and con, but Jaden Reed, the slot wide receiver, was so reliable, so dangerous on all those jet sweeps and all of the ways that uh, Matt LaFleur was able to manufacture touches for him, but he was a huge playmaker for the Packers. Over 800 yards, eight touchdowns on the season for him in his rookie year, but then Romeo Dobbs, we had just been criticizing him again at the end of the last episode. Coming up that Vikings game, he had three straight games with drops. And that's just been such a frustrating theme for Romeo Dobbs is the hands consistency. Uh, but really clean it up in the second half of the year. Did have a couple of games with drops. But once the playoffs turned around, I mean, he was a monster. He had 240 yards on 12 targets, uh, 10 receptions in, in the two playoff games. No drops caught uh, two out of his three contested catch looks. What's impressive about Dobbs, too, is he actually ended up converting 15 out of 28 contested catch looks, uh, looks on the season, and that percentage escalated into the second half of the year. Um, Jordan Love really started to trust him, and Romeo Dobbs made him right on a lot of those looks. So, you know, if, if he's really starting to get confidence as a potential number one wide receiver, which he was this team's leading receiver... This is a player that's gotten some hype, um, but I think the second half of the year really started to return some of that hype. And then Dontavion Wicks, look, I I was so dead wrong about Dontavion Wicks as a prospect. I only watched his final season because that's usually what I do for most prospects, but a lot of Wicks defenders were saying, hey, you got to go back and watch the year before because I don't even know what the reason was, injuries or bad coaching or whatever. And I didn't do that. And whatever, I, I mean, I think there was probably some development in there too, but whatever people were seeing in his junior year tape, there was something there, man, because he's been the most reliable weapon of all of these guys in Green Bay. He is the physical guy. He's the guy that's available over the middle that is going to come down with that tough catch, but not just that. Um, muscle guys up after the catch and be that kind of instigator out there. But it's not just that. Um, I mean, you look at some of the routes he's running, the footwork, the releases. Like, he's got starter traits 100% and put up starter production this year as well. 605 yards, five touchdowns. 
Um, doesn't sound like a ton necessarily, but remember, he's splitting with all these different guys. He was 27th in the NFL in yards per route run. So when he was getting out there, he was winning and he was converting. So he looks awesome. Bo Melton comes in from Seattle. I mean, gosh, it, as if they couldn't have stumbled into enough of these guys stepping up. Uh, goodness, I mean, Melton, the speedster out of Rutgers, kind of gets his first opportunity here in Green Bay, was a guy a lot of people in the draft community liked. Um, but he's been making plays when they called his number. The Minnesota game was a monster. Six catches for 105 yards and a touchdown. Uh, caught that touchdown against the Niners in the playoffs. And then even the tight ends. Uh, obviously, you hoped for this uh, with these two rookie tight ends. Uh, but definitely uh, in the second half of the year, these guys played well. And, and Kraft really got his opportunity because Musgrave got hurt and missed a good six weeks in there. Um, but yeah, Kraft was weird because he got no camp hype, was stashed as like the third tight end on the roster, did nothing in the first half. And it was like, oh man, is this another like Brian Gutekunst third round draft pick curse? Well, something clicked. And the same guy that you would inevitably have loved if you watched his tape at South Carolina or at least a highlight reel, um, like his highs at South Carolina were a nasty physical tight end that loves to get the ball in his hands, make guys miss after the catch, um, reliable pair of hands. And he was all of that for Green Bay. And then Luke Musgrave, also just very steady all year long. Now it's only the beginning for these guys, especially for Musgrave, where I feel like Musgrave still has some more dynamism that can be untapped here in Green Bay. It was a lot more um, just, I don't want to say easy catches, but just more basic possession tight end usage uh and then of course the big like he had the big chunk plays a couple times on Y leak uh where he was it was more scheme right not like he was doing a whole lot um but either way both these young tight ends on nearly identical stat lines both ended up the season uh right around 40 receptions about 400 yards uh and a couple to a few touchdowns each and both rate at about 50 targets. So they actually were uh, pretty neck and neck, and hence why we're going to leave them both as a 72 heading into next year. But this duo for a team that does like to run the ball under Lafleur and does like to run 12 personnel, that's obviously a big reason why they drafted two tight ends early. Uh, you're obviously excited for that group as well. Um, and then even Ben Sims, who is a rookie out of Baylor, uh, was undrafted. Um, was picked up undrafted. He did his part as a blocker this year too, so he's going to get a little bit of love. Uh, so the playmakers in Green Bay plus the quarterback, uh, it's hard to find a more exciting uh, just kind of narrative with the youth and, and projection for this team. Um, but then on the offensive line, the, the tackles were kind of bookend tackles this year. Uh, Rashid Walker, I mean, you talk about the whole, like, the, how do the Packers keep getting away with it meme with the quarterback? That exists for the tackle position, too. I mean, honestly, it, it started years and years ago with, like, David Bakhtiari and all that, but their ability to find these guys like Zach Tom and Rashid Walker has been a staple of the Packers' uh, success for a long time. I've had my criticisms of this front office, but not when it comes to offensive linemen. And Rashid Walker, I'm curious to see, like, I mean, the, the draft will tell us how they think about Rashid Walker in terms of do they spend a high draft pick on a guy but you know walker was interesting because he in his junior year was like a five star or maybe a high four star type of prospect was a potential first round pick had a bad year went back um for his senior year was a little bit better but ended up going in the seventh round after that like man i he's got the traits right so there's not a lot to say that he can't continue to build upon this first year as a starter where he was a really solid pass protector. He was right in there as probably like the 20 to 24th best left tackle in the league this year, just from pass protection standpoint. Would love to see him use that size to move guys in the run game a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's definitely an option for them as a starting left tackle next year. Uh, and then Zach Tom, uh, there's nothing really left to say about Zach Tom. He turned into a nasty run blocker this year, just getting really comfortable with his checks as he's climbing in these wide zones and sealing that edge. Uh, was steady again as a pass protector. His his total pass protection grade's going to take a hit on the season after his last two games of the season had to go against Nick Bosa and Micah Parsons. Uh, it's going to happen a little bit, but 
but you know, the eight weeks before that, pretty much locked down. Love Zach Tom. I feel like everybody loves Zach Tom. He was a draft sleeper for a lot of people, and Packers are the ones that ended up with him, fortunately for them. Um, and then let's talk about this defense. A lot of players to talk about there as well. I mean, there's a, there have a lot of youth on that side of the ball too, and a lot of guys stepping up. In really the last like four to five weeks of the season when Joe Barry's defense actually bunkered down and put the fear of God in Packers fans that he might actually be back next year. Uh, but especially with those those guys up front, their interior defensive linemen really clicked in this year. They've got a really nasty combination of, of body types and athletes up front here. But let's get into them. Um, Devontae Wyatt, I would say a breakout season in year two. Ends up with 48 pressures, seven sacks, and just, I would say, mostly steady throughout the year. Um, Former first-round pick, incredible athletic profile. It's not a huge surprise, but you love to see that showing up, of course. Uh, He's a weapon on passing downs. Now, the next step in his game would be, hopefully, he can become a little bit more of an active run defender, but they do have some pieces that they rotate that allow him to not be... Uh, put out there as much in run defense but Carl Brooks the sixth round pick out of Bowling Green I mean they just kind of got lucky on Carl Brooks and I'm not going to say lucky like they obviously liked him and took him before other teams and like they deserve credit for that but anytime a sixth round pick who was like a, a tweener who played edge in college who had to step inside you don't really know how that's going to translate and Green Bay was the team that was willing to take the risk in that spot. Smart, right? But he really has translated as an interior player. As a rotational piece, Carl Brooks ended up with 30 pressures, four sacks, 21 QB hurries, and was kind of what you expected as a run defender for a guy that played on the edge, is a little bit undersized, where down in, down out, you're not really going to ask too much of him. And I mean, he played 300 pass rush snaps to 100 run defense snaps, so that was his role, right? Um, But he did occasionally splash into the backfield to make some stuff happen against the run, too. He had 13 defensive stops on those 130 run defense snaps, so about 10% of those snaps, he was making something happen in the backfield. So, at worst, he is one of the best, like, rotational pass rushing interior players who's not a starter in the league, right? Uh, at best, they may have found a starting caliber guy. I mean, it's year one of him playing interior defensive line, and he showed up at a pretty high level. He was 45th in PFF pass rush grade for all interior defensive linemen in the league and was um, 44th in pressures. And in fact, his profile for the season is almost identical to Brian Brzee out of New Orleans. And I like Brian Brzee. I'm not saying their projections are the same, but my point is you you end up with that kind of player in the sixth round. Like, that's a huge piece of all of the surprise success that they've had this season. And then not quite as much to rave about here, but Colby Wooden, who was a fourth round pick, another like dart throw at a tweener who is going back to playing interior here in the NFL after doing it a year earlier at Auburn before moving to edge you know, college defenses are all over the place, but um, didn't have as much of a role with how many guys they had up front here, but, you know, uh, he did okay in, in both roles, was was splashy as a run defender, had a couple splash pass rushes, nothing major here, 65 to a 66, um, but showed some promise. And then TJ Slayton, he's the guy with the hard hat that kind of opens a lot of the stuff up for these guys, plays a lot of the nose tackle, not going to get a ton of credit, but held his own against the run all season long, doubled his run snap count from the year before, so the coaches trust him a lot more to do this. And I really don't think it's a coincidence that in an identical number of run defense snaps, Kenny Clark um, ended up with seven more defensive stops this year and a better PFF run defense grade because TJ Slayton was doing that nose tackle role more often, again, opening things up for everybody else. And Kenny Clark, I've talked about, doesn't really play like a true nose tackle like TJ Slayton can. So it's important to have that piece, especially when this team was was 3-4, but um, I think still is going to matter as a 4-3 team moving forward next year, and, and they'll still run some you know bare fronts with Slayton. Uh, and then Kenny Clark, again, 
you know, we just talked about how his run defense was better this year. Uh, but, you know, we had lowered him in last episode of Studs and Duds by just one because his pass rush production was just not where it's been throughout his career. And then he just reversed course on that. He had, I don't know if I can quite say a career year, but not too far off. Ended up with 66 pressures, um, credited with 10 sacks per PFF, you know, seven and a half per the the box score counting stats or whatever, but still a very effective pass rusher in the second half of the year. As we know, he's capable of, it was just not there in the first half of the year. Um, and, but unfortunately, there is one player on the Packers defense that kind of went in reverse course of what the rest of the team did. Rashawn Gary, who started the year on this like potential defensive player of the year type trajectory coming off that ACL was on like a, a, a lower snap count and was just shattering efficiency numbers in terms of getting after the quarterback. Uh, but he actually, once that workload got back to 100%, his numbers actually dropped down. Now, I will give him some credit. He had by far his best year as a run defender, which has been a strange frustration for Rashawn Gary as such a big edge defender. Um, so that counts for something, but uh, perhaps, you know, wasn't fully ready to go for those third down snaps, was was seeing a little bit of a drop off as opposed to when he was just coming in on third down to get after the quarterback. So it'll be something to keep an eye on. You guys know I love Rashawn Gary, but he was he was honestly like mediocre in the second half of the year. So he's getting a pretty major dip here for for that, and he's going to have to show more next year. Um, but fortunately for the Packers, as that was happening, Preston Smith turned it back around. Preston Smith, who was a pumpkin in the first half of the year, remembered how to pa uh, rush the passer. Uh, he had like this, he was like strangely kicking Christian Derrissaw's ass in that big uh, week 17 game against the Vikings or 16. Can't remember which week that was. Uh, but showing that kind of dip move that he's so good at. Uh, another good year as a run defender. So I feel like Preston Smith will probably be back next year at this point, which I would not have said in the first half of the year. Then we get to the linebackers. Quay Walker just continually, uh, continuing to get incrementally better in Green Bay. I think he's getting much more comfortable with his run keys. You're not seeing quite as many... Um, run gashes towards Quay Walker, and a large part of that too is his missed tackle percentage has gone up. Still not like seeing it super quickly and being like a dominant run defender. He's certainly not a liability out there as a run defender, as I would say he was in his first year. So you love to see that, right? Am I gonna like walk back my Quay Walker draft analysis where I thought it was a bad draft pick? No, I'm not, because I did say he'll probably turn into a solid player in time. We're seeing that happening incrementally. Um, problem is, he's still an average NFL linebacker here heading into year three. But we don't need to drone on about that. It's good to see Quay um, grow in, into a, a pretty solid player here. And I'm curious to see if the new defensive coordinator is going to blitz him. Because, man, when Quay Walker blitzes, it is electric. I'll give him that credit. Um the Packers just have not decided to do that enough. So I'm very excited to see the scheme change if, if they do that more. I'm also excited for the scheme change because it sounds like they're going to go more 4-3. And there, that means there's going to be, at least in like early downs, base fronts, there's going to be an opportunity for Isaiah McDuffie to have a, a quasi-starting role with the Packers as opposed to like he's just playing when these other guys get hurt or in like very small packages that they like to use him. Um, but a contract year coming up for Isaiah McDuffie, I really liked him as a day three pick, a ton of athletic ability. He flies to the ball, and as a weak side backer and a 4-3 front, I feel like that could be a really fun fit for him next year. And, and you know, he ended up playing a lot of snaps for the Packers. And I, I, mean, I know I come off as a huge Quay Walker hater, but I think this is somewhere in between where this is a credit to Isaiah McDuffie. They really didn't miss a beat uh, when Walker was out and McDuffie was in. Um, and then uh, into the secondary Really nothing major. It was a lot of backups getting playing time and holding up like, okay. So Corey Valentine, one of those guys. Now Carrington Valentine is a little more exciting uh, because he's a 21 years old coming out of the SEC, has all of the tools to be a potential starter in the league. And, you know, he had outings where he looked like a starter. It was just very an up and down season for a seventh round rookie corner, which you expect. Uh, but man, 
Heat, in my opinion, is a hit as a seventh round player. He is at least a solid backup. Um, but I mean, he's just getting started. I'm really excited about Carrington Valentine. Uh, he was a my guy in that draft. Uh, I had a third or fourth round grade on him because I felt like he was just getting started. And I mean, pretty good, pretty good rookie year for the kid. Uh, and then Keyshawn Nixon, just so much playing time at this point. He stumbled into a decent amount of pass breakups and exciting weeks out there as a slot corner. Very much up and down. He should not be starting, um, but he's now played two straight years as a starter, and that counts for something. Um, great kick returner. And then Darnell Savage did end up with a solid season, had that pick six against the the Cowboys, dropped what could have been a game-winning pick six against the Niners uh, early in the game, a, a game-changing pick six, I guess you could call that. Uh, another guy that I feel like is a backup at this point, granted, I would be curious to see him not playing a Fangio style safety role. Uh just because I just I don't think that's really how he how he plays. Like I would love to see him as a free safety, like a, a true free safety. I would love to see him as a slot corner. Uh Joe Barry never decided to really use him in that role. So I'm not completely giving up on Darnell Savage, but uh very week to week. Uh but overall a solid season gonna go up plus one. And then Anthony Johnson not a ton of playing time, but did have a nice interception all the way back week nine against the Rams. Um, and just, again, was very up and down. They were moving these guys in and out because no one could really settle in with like two or three straight good weeks. Um, but when we've got them rated that low down in the 60s and they're at least showing that they can have good games in the NFL and getting playing time, you know, they're going to go up a little bit. So I don't want to spend too much time on those guys because I don't know that other than maybe Valentine, that any of these guys are like the future of the Packers secondary. Um, but again, they had to count on these guys and they held up OK. And then we'll wrap up Anders Carlson. I, I mean, dude, he's so bad. I I get that they wanted a rookie kicker. This was supposed to be a retooling year, but Man, it's it is frustrating because he obviously misses the kick in the Niners game that would have made it a game that goes to overtime. Who knows what happens from that point on? But uh, you know, it was a big part of the team's season ending. Uh, cost them at least two games throughout the season: the Steelers game and the and the Broncos game. They probably win those games if he makes his kicks. So, like, it was a problem all year long. And the the people that did have kicker analysis didn't think this was a good pick. I you know I don't watch the kickers, so I didn't really know. But they said this was not really a draftable kicker. Seems like he got drafted because his brother is a Pro Bowler. Um, but yeah, I mean the dude missed six extra points this year. That that should tell you all you need to know. That was by far the most in the NFL. So he's he's coming way down uh, after like a decent enough start to the year. Um, but yeah, it just it fell off a cliff. The Packers got to go get themselves um, a more proven commodity because they're going to have expectations next year. You cannot hold on to this kicker because you spent a draft pick on him. That that could potentially be catastrophic for a team that predictable special teams mistakes have kind of cost them two playoff games against the Niners in the last three years. So maybe don't let that happen again. Uh, but all right, we, we got through it. A lot to talk about there for Green Bay. Let's move on. And then we wrap up with the Minnesota Vikings, who are not going to have quite as many movers here, not quite saving the best for last year. You know, we our last episode was week seven, week eight, Kirk goes out there and tears his Achilles. They had a little fun with Josh Dobbs for a little bit there, but man, the second half of the season for the Vikings was a grind, so not as much to talk about from them. From that part of the season, I'm not going to say it was a total waste of a season, though, because I think they still learned more about their offense. And overall, you're still impressed by what this defense was able to do under Brian Flores, even though, as you can already see, just two players going up on the defense for the second half of the year here. The defense did certainly fall off on the second half of the year, but um, still some guys to talk about here. And the star of the season for the Vikings We've had a Jalen, we've had a Jordan, could have had a Jared, arguably, for the Lions, and now we've got another Jordan here in the NFC North. Jordan Addison, the rookie wide receiver, first round pick out of USC, just looked the part 
of like everything you could have wanted him to be based on his draft profile and what they wanted from him, bringing him in here to be Justin Jeff- uh, Jefferson's running mate. Everything you could have wanted to see in a year where the quarterback play fell off a cliff and he was had to, you know, he was asked to be their number one wide receiver for half of the year with Justin Jefferson out. And while as the season went on, his production dropped off, and I think you can say, you know, there were certainly reps that you could see on film where he is getting pressed at the line of scrimmage, his small frame, his small size. It's just a reason he's not a number one, right? Like even in that Niners game where he was so impressive overall, there was reps where they're able to take Shaveris Ward and just jam him at the line of scrimmage and take him out of the play. Well, you know, when Justin Jefferson's in there, that's not going to be the case all the time. So um, overall, given the fact that for even more than the second half of the year, um, they had abysmal quarterback play, he still had 911 yards and 10 touchdowns. Like he he is a really polished wide receiver so uh, such great body control excellent route runner i mean as long as everything comes together with the quarterback play next year the vikings really have set this thing up well and even though it wasn't a perfect season uh in in many ways um you you feel like jordan addison is a hit for what they drafted him to be and he should be able to hit the ground running next year um Some of the guys on the offense going up here, Ty Chandler kind of finally got his opportunity here in the last month of the year, and he made the most of it. He had like 150 yards or something against the Bengals, just put his head down, got to work, was a grinder in that game. And then in the final week of the year against Detroit, I mean, that might have been his most impressive game, Uh, had 70 yards on 12 attempts, made five defenders miss in that game. I mean, he's got juice, right? He he ran like in the four threes, but there's always been a little bit of something missing with Ty Chandler. And I'm not going to lie, watching his film, I still see a guy that I'm not going to say puts his like head down, like he still picks the right hole and stuff, but I don't see a ton of creativity as a runner or like looking to use his speed all the time. He's kind of just taking what the blocking gives him a lot of the time. And he's like holding the ball like a toddler holds his teddy bear, like full wrap two arms. And while he didn't fumble at all this year, it's like, you know, you can you can get one of those arms free and use a stiff arm. So like, I, I still don't know that I'm like convinced that he can be a starter, but you know, for a fifth round pick that only got six attempts in his rookie year, finally got out there, put up four and a half yards of carry on a hundred attempts this year. If nothing else, is an athletic guy and a, and a quality backup. Was solid in the receiving game as well, where he was really good at North Carolina. And then all three of these tight ends are going to go up. TJ Hawkinson, who actually struggled early in the year with Kirk Cousins, to no fault of Kirk Cousins, TJ was just dropping the football. Um, TJ Hawkinson really kicked it up when the backup quarterbacks came in and was like, all right, they're paying me $20 million. I should probably man up and be a really good tight end again. And he did. He, he was super solid, uh, kind of, I think, restaked his claim as a, as a top five tight end um, in, in this National Football League. Yet another reason to be super excited for this group of weapons because you've got Jefferson, you've got Addison, you've got Hawkinson. The three sons of anarchy there really could be a, a problem if they can get that quarterback position right. And then Hawkinson actually got hurt for about the last month of the season. And what was interesting was they actually asked Johnny Munt to become the starter and be the TJ Hawkinson role, uh, which makes a little bit of sense because he's more in the physical mold of Hawkinson, more of a taller, lankier tight end. And then they just asked Josh Oliver to stay in that 12 personnel tight end two role. And it actually continued to work. Johnny Munt really stepped up, did have a really brutal drop in the Lions game. But other than that, uh, consistent in the receiving game and is still an underrated blocker for like being an undersized tight end. So he's a he's like maybe the best third tight end in the league right now. Um, and then Josh Oliver really played that role well. They wanted to get into 12 personnel a lot this year. And when Jefferson went down, it became even easier to do that. And Josh Oliver, who they paid off of a breakout season in Baltimore as a run blocker, um, 
double down on that. Like he did what they paid him to do. And that doesn't like that sounds obvious, but that doesn't always happen. So he has stayed that nasty physical run defender. Didn't really throw a fit when Hawkinson went down and Johnny Munt got that starting role, still kept his head down, did his job. Um, and that's admirable. So this is a really nasty tight end trio. And you don't want to overlook that when, you know, they do have all these wide receivers too. Um, and then on the offensive line, Christian Derrissaw, <laughs> It's like as long as he's not playing the Green Bay Packers, he's one of the best left tackles in the NFL. Those were his two worst games of the season this year. For some reason, Preston Smith just um, took his lunch money this this year. But seriously, lockdown pass protector, nasty run blocker. He is on that trajectory towards being one of the highest paid, highest regarded tackles in the league. Needs to like stay healthy for a full season, but came very close to doing that this year. Played. Uh, 15 games uh, at an incredibly high, incredibly high level has gone up already this year, going up again here. And then Ed Ingram just incrementally getting better, steadily climbing here. Not going to sit here and rave about Ed Ingram and say he's a franchise guard and that they hit on him as a second round pick, but he has developed from liability in year one to like low end starting caliber player slash replacement level player. Like he wasn't a liability every week for the Vikings as a pass protector. And you do definitely see his athleticism and his play strength show up in the run game from time to time. So they're, they're working on it. He's growing. We're giving him credit for it. We'll see, see where he's at next year in year three. He will be their starter again, I would imagine. And then on the defense, as I mentioned, most of the stuff that we are praising Brian Flores' defense for happened in the first half of the season. I think when you look at the second half of the year, um, you know, really the the play of those safeties dropped off. Um, Bynum and Metellus, they were getting like superhero efforts from those guys every week in the first half of the year. And they, they weren't really getting that. You weren't getting the pass rush up front. They just don't have the bodies on this defense. That's why it was so impressive that they were a top 10 defense in the first half of the year. Definitely not so much in the second half. So I'm not going to lower those guys, but um, again, just not a lot of guys showing up big for the Vikings defense in the second half. Uh, but the guys that did were rookies. Avon Pace Jr., the undrafted linebacker, uh, arguably the best rookie linebacker in the league this year. Such an impressive job to take this job full storm here. Um, and, you know, he showed the same elite blitzing ability that was so unique about him at Cincinnati. But, you know, the thing I said about Avon Pace is like, I feel like people say, oh, undersized, he can't play run defense, he can't cover, he doesn't have the range. His tape was was pretty fun in both regards, and I think that all translated in year one as a rookie, and he's he's going to continue to refine his game for what it's got to be at the NFL level, but he actually moved really well in space, in coverage. He had active eyes and would you know, navigate towards those passing lanes. And we saw some of that here for the Vikings. Like he's an excellent third down linebacker already because of his blitzing ability, um, but he's, he's a really instinctive run defender too. And you know, he's getting better and better, I feel like, at when to gamble, when to shoot gaps, because he has to do that at his size. He's never going to be like an elite stack and shed type of linebacker because he's 5'11", 220 pounds, or 230 soaking wet. But, um, you know, he can knife into the backfield and shoot gaps and, and beat pulling linemen to spaces and stuff, and his diagnostics are getting there, man. So he's really fun. I, I think he's going to be around here at least as long as Brian Flores is around because he's going to be able to put him in a great position to succeed with that blitzing ability. And then Makai Blackman, kind of a polarizing second half of the season. Um, you look at what he did like weeks 8 through 12. Uh, he was on like a shutdown trajectory for the Vikings. And you got to remember, they're a three safety base defense. So there's only so many cornerback snaps to go around. Um, but he was getting starter, uh, starter reps in that time. And then heading into that last like month of the year, it really felt like he had earned the starting job, probably over a Caleb Evans. And they didn't go that direction. He still was kind of rotating snaps. And he gave up some plays at the end of the year. So he, he certainly cooled off a little bit, but still had a pass, even if he was giving up some plays, still had a pass breakup in each of the last three games. So 
he looks the part to me. He only played um, 434 snaps this season, so it's a small sample size. Um, but his speed, his confidence in a man-to-man defense, and you know, this was Brian Flores' guy. He came out and said, get me Makai Blackman in the, th- in the third round. That's why I was a little surprised his playing time wasn't more, but uh, definitely definitely showed what you co- everything you could have dreamed for for a third-round corner. And I would imagine they'll rewatch the tape and want to get Makai Blackman in, his, in there as a starter next year, I, I would think. But we'll see, I guess. Vikings, maybe not the most exciting end to their season, but... Um, you know, there, there are reasons to be excited about the Vikings in general. It just, you know, everything seemed to go the Bears, Packers, and uh, Lions way in the second half of the year. And that seemingly came at the expense of the Vikings at times. Uh, but who knows? Maybe they'll get their revenge next year. The NFC North is going to be a ton of fun next season. And that is going to do it for today's division. Thank you so much for watching. If you could, please hit that like button on the way out. It does help me out. Let me know in the comments down below where you agree, which players do you disagree or think I omitted from your favorite teams. Let me know all of it in the, descri- uh, in the comments down below. Uh, but until next time, peace out. Peace out.